thank you, Your Excellency. Um, and indeed, um, following um, Mark's um, comments, there was no better way for me to start to talk about how this might um, shape itself in some practical form. Umberto Eco said of contemporary Europe, and he might have been saying of the contemporary world, that the language of the world today is a language of translation. Our contexts are all so present that what we need to do for each other is translate their contexts, their intentions, and their um, aspirations. So in this opportunity that you've given me, Your Excellency, an opportunity for an artist to take the language of diplomacy, the poetry of diplomacy, the subtle ambiguity of diplomacy, the occasional disconnect between truth and reality of diplomacy, and translate that into the work and the, the realm of artists. Because I would like to remind you all here that beyond the questions of global governance, beyond the questions of multilateral and unilateral questions of cultural diplomacy, the true cultural dip diplomats are amongst you in your citizens. They are your artists. And they come to a festival that I've just been running in Edinburgh in enormous numbers every year. Consider this. You think that the biggest collection internationally that is ever staged is the Olympic Games with its 15,000 participants. Well, consider for a fraction of the price that 27,000 artists um, come to the city of Edinburgh every year. A million people come to see them. They perform 40,000 individual performances in 5,000 discrete productions in 390 venues. Not a single piece of new <coughs> cultural infrastructure has been provided in the city of Edinburgh since 1947. Since when in 1947, Winston Churchill, with enormous wisdom, suggested though we might have succeeded in achieving peace um, through the cessation of military aims, the peace could still prove elusive. And he urged my distinguished predecessor, Sir Rudolf Bing, to think about strategies whereby people could come together. It's not particularly noted today, but in that very first festival in Edinburgh, the very first orchestra to perform was the Vienna Philharmonic Orchestra. Think about it. Every single member of that orchestra, had they performed two years earlier, would have been incarcerated as an enemy alien. And yet there they were in 1947 in a community that was still suffering from the deprivations of war, still suffering from food and petrol rationing. There they were in front of everyone being celebrated. And so the history that I've just given you a very small snapshot of what happened um, a month ago is as a result of very patient, very slow, and very long-term thinking about how artists, if given those opportunities when to come together, can actually achieve an extraordinary um, idea of cosmopolitanism in action. I don't like the word uh, multiculturalism. I prefer intercultural relationships, but I prefer more than that the active idea of cosmopolitanism. Because for me, the other idea of multiculturalism has become far, far too lazy. We accept other people's differences, we don't embrace them. And unless we are going to embrace those differences from a perspective of listening and engagement, we are actually just going to create a kind of more complex status quo, a, a more colourful kind of mosaic, but not one where the colour actually blends. So cosmopolitanism is what happens, I would like to suggest, when artists start to collaborate with each other, when artists who don't speak the same language actually collaborate on the same project. I was in a, in a, in a rehearsal room about a decade ago in Singapore with my distinguished colleague Ong Keng Sen. There were nine actors in the room and nine translators. 
About after the first week, the translators discovered they were no longer necessary, not because there was a common language of, of linguistic not notions, but because the actors themselves had found their common language. They had found their language through the physics, through the physical notion of their bodies, through the idea of how to talk to each other through their practices, through their cultures. Last week, I collaborated with Lincoln Center on a global exchange, a global exchange dedicated to uh, insisting and, in, and ensuring that in a week when the, the millennium and the global, globally sustainable um, goals are being discussed at the United Nations here, when the Clinton Global Initiative is talking about a whole range of things, there was actually an opportunity for a cultural dialogue. And if um, we did nothing more than this, we presented three dance companies on Friday night at Alice Tully Hall that represent, I think, one of the most ancient and the most contemporary notions of cultural diplomacy at work. In about a year's, in about six months' time, the Argentinian um, Prime Minister, Minister of Culture and Sport, and the Argentinian um, Ambassador to this, to this General Assembly will come and ask this General Assembly to pass um, a resolution acknowledging that those parts of Rio de Janeiro in which the Olympic Games is to be hosted and held be declared as international territory and that attached to that declaration the idea of the international, the Olympic truce will start to come into force. Because for me the ancient Olympic Games was not just a, a, a competition of sporting prowess. It was much more than that. It was active engagement at a cosmopolitan level with incredibly practical dimensions to it of what we've been talking about today. Imagine how many lives had been saved in the peoples of the world thousands of years ago going to and from Mount Olympus where the condition of their participation was that they had to offer free passage to those people going and coming from those Olympic Games. You didn't do that and you never got to compete again in those games. You do not do that today and you do not compete in those games. We need to reinvigorate this notion, this ancient notion of truce. And we need to acknowledge that it is not just sport and cultural opportunities from which these things flow, but we need to use those as ways of practicing how the idea of a truce can become permanent. No one told my predecessors in Edinburgh what would evolve out of the Edinburgh International Festival in 1947. Too many of them were too scarred by the horrors of Auschwitz and Leningrad. But they practiced their hopefulness, little by little, small step by small step, until we have the situation today where the sceptical population of Edinburgh, too often um, inconvenienced by the millions of people who turn up to this small city, start to work out that actually they are global citizens. And so that inconvenience is very temporary and it's much smaller than other achievements that they have offered. I will conclude by just giving you some very short examples in addition to those of my own career where I think people have had an extraordinary opportunity to create not a unilateral, not a multilateral, not a global um, um, idea of cultural diplomacy, but a very local and a very specific, a site-specific notion of this idea of cultural diplomacy. I mentioned Ong Keng Sen and Theatre Works in Singapore, where he regularly brings um, performers from many different nations together in one single production. Or my friend Harris Pasevich, whose response to the horrors of this, the siege of Sarajevo was to create a theatre company from Croatian Catholics, um, uh, Serbian Orthodox and Bosnian Muslims to play together in the one space as a symbol of the idea that if we're playing together, why aren't you all playing together?
of polyphony, an extraordinary music um, um, initiative from Nazareth that brings people from Mal Ramallah and Nazareth together on a very regular basis. Not senior musicians, but young people. They're absolutely focused on people under the age of 12. Or the extraordinary work of the Aga Khan Music Initiative in the central um, parts of, of Asia. The iCulture Orchestra, an initiative of the Polish Ministry of Culture, which ensures that there is an orchestral opportunity from everyone from Estonia to Georgia, from Poland to Ukraine, to actually play together in a similar orchestra to that of the East West Devan Orchestra, ma made so famous by Daniel Barenboim, or the um, Simon Bolivar Youth Orchestra, made so famous by Gustavo Dudamel. And perhaps the most interesting conversation I ever had with a very, very mainstream person was with my friend the percussionist Mickey Hart, the percussionist of the Grateful Dead, remember that extraordinary rock and roll band, who um, his response to the sustainable initiatives and the idea of climate change was to suggest a very important thing, that when a rainforest is torn down, it is, of course, a matter of scientific and statistical um, uh, horror to us all. But actually, we should all be focusing on the fact that our relationships with that particular part of the world, they also die. So if we can no longer sing a song about something that has been destroyed, it may as well not exist, because it doesn't exist in a collective memory. And so coming back finally to this idea that Umberto Eco had in, in, his, in his wise words about contemporary Europe, the notion that the, that the language of our, of our world is a language of translation. Let us make sure that our world is a language, uh, 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 that our world is populated by many languages and that we make sure that the songs of many tongues and of many places are able to um, suffuse themselves into our hearts and minds. That is truly what cultural diplomacy in action is all about. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>